All right. Thanks, everybody. We uh, might get started in a minute, and uh, if there are more people on the way, then they can they can jump in. Uh, first off, thanks again for uh, for joining. Uh, I'm David, as uh, the name tag suggests, and I've also got David Thurmond here. Hello, everyone. So I just wanted to start by saying that uh, buying your first home is such a huge step, and uh, it's such a privilege for us to help you all on that journey and and be a part of of that journey. It, it's it's a huge step, as I said, and there's so much involved. So hopefully the webinar tonight uh, helps you feel a little bit more informed and points you in the right direction before taking that uh, that first step. So. Awesome. What I'd uh, like to start with is introducing you to our team. So you've met David Thurmond and myself. We do also have uh, brokers in the office, Mandula, Carly and Alston, who are supported by our amazing admin team there in the middle and uh, our marketing team down the bottom there. And we obviously could not do anything that we do without them. So a huge thank you to the team. As uh, a lot of you would know, we do have our office in Berwick, just on High Street in Berwick. I'm sure a lot of you would have seen that just next to the pub there, but uh, that's a little bit about us. Now, what we're going to discuss tonight, obviously buying your first home and, and what that means, but uh, in more detail, we're gonna cover off uh, on the state of the market. So what's been happening with uh, interest rates, what's been happening with inflation, and of course, what's happening in the property market, the big one that we're all curious about. Once we've gone through that, we're going to go through uh, what's involved with buying your first home, uh, what kind of government grants and concessions are available, the savings that you might require to purchase your first home, your borrowing capacity and what that means. Uh, and a big one is actually going to be the importance of a pre-approval. I'm sure a lot of you would have heard of a pre-approval. What does that actually mean? What does it cover? We'll run through all of that and, and why it's such a key uh, detail when purchasing your first home, especially in today's market. And towards the end, we'll run through a little bit more about how we can help as a mortgage broker. And finally, we'll go through some questions. So uh, I might hand it over to you, David, to run through the state of the market. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, and just like uh, DL said earlier, um, we uh, are so privileged to be able to help clients buying their first houses. It, it's not often that you're going to spend six hundred to seven hundred thousand uh, dollars in your lifetime. So the fact that we get to be part of that and help guide you along the way, um, we are very appreciative. Um, state of the market, it's very important that when you look to purchase a property because of the uh, high purchase price, we want to make sure that we're aware of what's going on because that'll help inform your decisions and let you know if it's the right time for you to purchase. So um, as David mentioned, we'll talk about inflation um, first. That's probably the, I guess, the elephant in the room right now because it's driving a lot of things around the globe uh, that are directly impacting us. Uh, inflation, if you're not aware, is just the rise in the cost of goods and services. So a very simple example of 10% inflation is if you bought a TV last year or two years ago for $2,000, uh, now that TV would be uh, $2,200 because it's increased by 10%. So, um, and it's not just um, goods, it's also services. So if you're getting a, a landscape gardener to come around and, and do some work for you. If you're um, you're going to the hairdresser, all of the costs, all the things that we pay for have all gone up uh, in cost. Now, how will inflation affect you? Uh, well, it obviously means higher interest rates. And we've seen interest rates increase dramatically over the last year. Uh, it also means a higher cost of living and touched on that just a second ago with a higher cost of goods and services. Um, I won't uh, spend too much time on this slide, but I, I, I love uh, charts and graphs, especially uh, lovely line graphs like this one. Um, you can see in the first chart on the left-hand side, uh, the black and red lines uh, trending directly up. And this was from the middle of last year. And that's the sign of inflation coming to its peak. Um, and a lot of things will affect uh, inflation. So the war in Ukraine was a massive contributor to inflation. Uh, floods in Queensland and New South Wales, and uh, they made our veggies uh, suddenly a lot more expensive. So there are some headline uh, factors that uh, cause inflation, things that are kind of one-offs and out of our control. And then there's the underlying inflation in the red, and that's more the overall um, increase in costs for all the things that we have to purchase in our lives. 
On the right hand side, you can see the different areas in which inflation is affecting the most. So you can see transport is at 13.1% increase. And again, this is the middle of last year. Um, so I would imagine that's come down a little bit because petrol prices have eased off a bit, uh, but also housing. Um, so if anyone is in the building industry or is considered building and done their research on how, how expensive construction is, uh, it's crazy. Um, and it's probably increased by, I'd say, 30 to 40 percent over the last couple of years. Um, so those are just two of the biggest areas where we've seen the biggest increase in cost. Now, interest rates. Um, interest rates, uh, you have to be sleeping under a rock to not be aware of the, um, the drastic rise in interest rates over the last 12 months. Uh, if you can see on this chart, it only shows the last 12 months, and we were at a lovely 2% variable rate uh, for quite a long period of time there coming out of COVID. And then all of a sudden, in May of last year, the Reserve Bank panicked and realized that they were acting a bit late on inflation, and so they started increasing interest rates. And we have had a rate increase every month that the Reserve Bank has been in session since then. And so this is dramatic climb up over the last 10 to 12 months uh, to where we're at now. And you look at this chart and you think, oh my God, you know, where is this going to end? Are, are we in serious trouble here? But if we take some perspective and we zoom out and we look at this over the last 20 or 30 years, we're here at the very end uh, where we can see the uh, the um, trend line ticking back up uh, to that roughly 4% cash rate. Uh, if we look at the last 20 or 30 years, we're not in that bad a shape compared to where we've been uh, for the majority of that period. Uh, we haven't seen interest rates like this right now since 2012, um, but the point is that we did have rates that were higher at one stage and we all survived and we all managed. So it's just a matter of adjusting because we've had low interest rates for such a long period of time, it's now a little bit of a shock to the system to see them um, ticking up. Uh, the expectation is that we will see interest rates start to decrease. So the, um, the market and even the Reserve Bank have come out and said that uh, in late 2024 to early 2025, they're hoping that inflation will uh, be back under control and they'll need to use decreasing interest rates to stimulate the economy and get things going again. So the whole idea with increasing interest rates is that they break the economy and they stop everyone from spending. Uh, and then they put the economy back together again by lowering interest rates and encouraging people to spend. So it's a bit of a crazy system, but um, that's, the, that's the method behind it. Now, how high will rates, or sorry, how will higher rates affect you? Um, the biggest issue that we have right now, especially for first home buyers that are purchasing on their own, uh, it means that you've got reduced borrowing capacity. So a, a client that last year might have been on sixty to sixty-five thousand dollars a year, they could purchase a house for five hundred to five fifty. Um, that's dramatically uh, reduced now um, because of these higher rates, uh, and obviously reduced cash flow. If we've got higher interest rates to pay on our mortgage, it means we've got less cash in the bank to spend on fun stuff that we want or to put money into savings. So reduced cash flow is definitely a big issue. Now the property market. Um, the biggest question that I hear from first home buyers on the property market is when is the right time to buy? Um, because um, with the, uh, sorry, uh, there are some assumptions that with the uh, interest rates increasing, that the property market will start to drop down. And we've started seeing reports in the press, some very serious and dramatic doom and gloom reports in the press about property prices falling 10, 20, 30 percent. And so there are a lot of first home buyers standing back saying, well, lucky me, uh, I'm going to purchase and I'm going to save myself 30% on a property. Um, I don't see us getting to that point. Uh, and for a couple of reasons that we'll talk about in a second. Um, but the reason why we talk about the property market is to um, highlight that what you read in the press is there to sell newspapers and to get clicks. And so you need to be really careful with what you read because a lot of this stuff is, is nonsense and a bit sensationalized. Um, when the right time, when is the right time to buy? It's when you're ready. When you've got enough savings and it's affordable and it's comfortable and you've got a good savings buffer in place and you find a property that you love, that is the right time to buy. It's very hard to try and time the market because usually by the time you think it's the great time to buy, the market has already started to change. Um, so it's very, very hard to try and time the market. And you can only use hindsight to look back and say, yep, that was the right time to buy. I've done well. 
Uh, but it's really hard to look forward and say, well, I think in June or in July might be the best time to buy. Um, so very, very hard to judge. And here's a good reason why. Um, in the newspapers, you would see that property prices have fallen by 10 to 15% on average across the country. But that's mainly in certain pockets. And if we look at this chart here, this chart was done by uh, realestate.com.au, who owns Mortgage Choice now. Um, so we get all of their data. And what they're showing is that inner city suburbs in the more affluent areas, they have seen the biggest drop in values. Whereas the Southeast suburbs, where a lot of our clients are purchasing, they've only dropped by 3%. So again, if you're trying to time the market and you listen to the newspapers to try and time the market, you come up with something like this and you think, well, you know, property prices haven't really dropped that much in the area I'm trying to purchase in. So how well can you actually time it? All right, um, David Lalene, I might hand it back over to you and you can discuss um, the steps to purchase your first house. Yeah, thank you. I'm really glad that you pointed out that uh, it's about that perspective. Um, not everywhere has decreased by 10 to 15% and not everywhere will. And uh, buying when you're ready is, is such a good piece of advice. I, I can't tell you how many clients wanted to wait when these interest rates started to rise and every single rise has put them further and further behind and they're kicking themselves now. But uh, it's when you're ready. It's when you are ready. So great piece of advice there. Now. What you need when you're purchasing your first home, there are essentially five key details that we need to review or need to consider when we're purchasing. The first one, especially these days, is such a huge benefit, a huge um, assistant in getting into your first home, the government grants. So what government grants are you eligible for? And what's actually out there? Savings. Do you have the sufficient savings required by the bank to purchase your first home? And that could be due to a number of reasons with uh, different purchase price or your borrowing capacity. Which leads into the next point. What actually is your borrowing capacity? What's a good borrowing capacity? And how does that impact your purchase price? And the last two are just as important. Uh, a clean credit report. This means no late payments on existing debts like a car loan or a credit card. And of course, no defaults. And, and defaults could um, come from any number of places. So we'll run through those a little bit later. Last thing that we need when we're purchasing our first home, this is important now more than ever, is a pre-approval. And we'll go into it in a more detail, obviously, in a minute, but cannot stress to you how important a pre-approval is now. And that's definitely where we need to start uh, with this journey. <clears throat> so I'll start with the government grants. The grants that are most common these days, uh, uh, well, there are two. There's a stamp duty and a first home guarantee. But essentially what they do is they are going to reduce the deposit that you need to get into your first home. And obviously that's what we need. We want to get into our first home as quickly as possible and uh, with as minimal output as we can. So that's really what we want to see. On the back end of a lower deposit, we have a lower loan that we need to get uh, into the property. A lower loan means more cash in our pocket, which is fantastic. That's what we all want, a house that doesn't cost us the world. It doesn't mean we have to eat minute noodles to live in that house. And finally, the fees that are associated with, uh, with purchasing a house. Government grants, some of them, will actually help avoid some of the fees that you might incur by purchasing. Stamp duty is one that I mentioned before in lenders mortgage insurance is a massive, massive fee that you can avoid with some of these government grants. So the first one that we'll talk about is that stamp duty concession. When you're purchasing your first home, you receive a waiver on stamp duty as long as you purchase for $600,000 or less. If you purchase for anything above 600 or anything between 600 and 750, you receive a discount, not a full waiver. There are a couple of conditions with that. If you purchase, you have to move into the property within 12 months. And that 12 months starts from when you take ownership. This is important to keep in mind if you're purchasing from an investor. And they might have a tenant in the property who is legally allowed to remain in that property for another three months. So you can't move in. If that's the case, you can move in afterwards, but you've only got nine months left to move in. So that's a really important detail to keep in mind when purchasing. It's rare that you'll purchase from an investor and have that issue, but it's something to keep in mind. 
The, uh, the second grant that's really helping our clients right now is the first home guarantee. And you would have seen this one quite a lot. This is essentially the government becoming a guarantor for you. Now, a guarantor works in a way that they provide another asset as a security for the bank and it removes some of the risk that the bank is worried about. So they charge uh, lower fees or remove fees and they provide a lower interest rate on the mortgage as well. So the first home guarantee is the same thing. The government will provide an additional security for the bank up to 15% of the property's value. The bank's not as worried about the risk that they're taking on, so they don't charge you their lender's mortgage insurance fees. Because technically there's less risk and there's more security, they also offer you a lower rate. So win-win for first home buyers. Again, there are some conditions. The big one is that you need a 5% deposit, 5% of the purchase price. And that 5% must be savings. We'll run through it a little bit later, but you also need to cover the costs associated with the purchase from those savings. And the final condition is that uh, you are an Australian citizen. So not just a permanent resident. Before we go on to the next one, I think it's important to just point out the cost savings for um, that first home guarantee. When we talk about a waiver of mortgage insurance, I think it's important for clients to realize that that's going to save you fifteen to twenty thousand dollars in fees that the bank would normally charge you without that um, without that government scheme. So it's a fantastic opportunity to save fifteen to twenty thousand dollars and also reduce the amount of savings that you have. It's a great scheme. It is. It is fantastic, and they've been running that for what is that two years now? A little bit over two years, I think, and it's been amazing for our clients. So. Highly, highly recommend. What we don't recommend is the home buyer fund. It works very similar. You might have heard about this one as well, but rather than the government providing a security for the property, they will actually take ownership in your property. So very similar in the sense that you contribute 5% from your savings as a deposit, uh, but rather than just an additional security for the bank, the government actually provides cash towards the purchase and then they take ownership in your property for the same value. Not a fan. Uh, it's also subject to an annual review, which means if your income breaches their, uh, their cap, then you're no longer eligible. You have to pay them back. If you don't have sufficient insurance policies, if you haven't maintained the property to their standards, which there's a, a list of criteria, again, you're not eligible. You have to pay them back. And this could backfire in a few years when these uh, eligibility reviews start to take place. So this isn't one that we recommend. This uh, scheme here, just to um, clarify for everyone, this is the Victorian home buyer fund that you've likely heard about on the radio or potentially on TV ads. Um, a lot of first home buyer clients will ask us about this fund. And as soon as they hear that the government is part owner of your home, they immediately say, no, no, this isn't for us. So as mortgage brokers, we need to uh, educate our clients on what schemes are available. And as details outlined um, uh, quite perfectly, uh, there is a could scheme, the federal scheme, where the government is just a guarantor for your loan. And then there is what we consider, I can't, what can we call it bad? Like it is, it's not the greatest scheme in the world when you're it's government. Less good. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A less good scheme, uh, which is a Victorian home buyer scheme. So just be very mindful of the differences between the two. We want the federal scheme. Okay. Yes. And the final one, which I'm sure all of you have heard about, is the first homeowner grant. And the first homeowner grant is a little bit different to the stamp duty concessions and the first home buyer uh, guarantees in the sense that it's only available for a brand new property and it is a cash deposit or a gift, really. The government will give you $10,000 cash towards the purchase. Property has to be brand new or never lived in as a condition. Uh, similar to stamp duty, you have to move in within 12 months. And we're going to go back to that in a second. Uh, but you also do uh, just have to be a permanent resident, not, not a citizen. Now, property being brand new or never lived in isn't something we're seeing quite a lot of these days, mainly because uh, for the most part, it requires a build. So you could purchase a block of land, uh, sign a contract for a builder to build you a brand new, lovely house. And then you're eligible for the grant. Now, not many people are building right now because of the time that it takes land to settle. Some clients are waiting a year, two years, uh, potentially even longer 
before the land is even ready for the builder to start. It's a long time. In the current climate, we don't know if rates are going to increase to a point where you can no longer afford that purchase, but you've already signed the contract. So it's very, very risky. You could sign up for a contract now, wait 12 to 24 months and no longer be able to afford that contract and you could lose your deposit. So with rates increasing as they have over the last you know, 10 months, not many people are signing up for new builds. Uh, on top of that, as David mentioned, um, larger economic factors such as increased timber costs, increased wage costs uh, for treaties means that uh, the building is actually very, very expensive these days. The prices are very inflated. And so we have seen a few clients sign a contract to build for a set price, for argument's sake, 400,000. But when a bank has valued the property, it's come back low. They think that the client is overpaying and that can cause all kinds of problems. It's a much lighter discussion with building, but the second type of property that you would be eligible for a first time owner grant is off the plan, which is similar, but you sign a contract, the builder goes off and does the work, and then you pay them when they're finished. So it sounds great, but again, you have to wait quite a while. Will you be able to afford that property at the time that it's ready when you have to pay for it or not? That's the, the risk that not many clients are taking these days. So we tend to see less of the first time owner grant these days than we did you know, two to three years ago. Now, moving into the property within 12 months is something I want to touch on a little bit as well. If you have settled on your block of land, uh, say March, you have to move into the house by next March. You have 12 months to move in, which means that the builder needs to go off and obtain their permits. You need to have found a builder and then they need to finish the construction with you moving in by March. And there have been some cases where it gets very, very tight, where we get to the 10th or 11th month and the build's not quite finished. Will the clients actually move in in time or not? And if they don't, maybe they're not actually eligible for these grants that we've obtained and they have to repay them. So there's quite a lot of risk when we're building. So we're not seeing as much of the first time owner grant these days. You hear the word risk quite a bit and you'll continue to hear it uh, when you start speaking with it directly because our job as brokers is to try and identify all the potential pitfalls that you might have as a first home buyer. And when we start um, explaining these risks to first home buyers, they're quickly, uh, um, I guess, late, they quickly lean towards purchasing an established home because it's a safer option in an environment where there's a lot of fluctuation and a lot of uncertainty with increased interest rates uh, increased costs like DL mentioned uh, and uh, borrowing capacity suffering because of it. So um, because of all that uncertainty, um, it seems to be um, that established is a much safer option at this time. Yeah. Yeah. And as a lot of millennials are impatient, they just want to move in. Who wants to wait two years to find out that uh, you've got to wait another year? It just takes, takes so long. That's a bit about the grants. So David, I might pass back to you to talk about the uh, the next important detail about purchasing a first home and that is savings. Yes, fantastic. Um, so when we look at confirming someone's borrowing capacity and looking at what they can afford, um, there are two main things that we focus on. One is savings and the other one is your income and your, your total borrowing capacity. So we'll tackle savings first. Uh, when we look at savings, uh, we are looking at um, uh, how much savings you need based on your purchase price. Because oftentimes we're trying to minimize how much someone needs to put in. And the minimum savings that you need is 5% of the purchase price. So what the bank wants and what the government also wants to qualify for their grants is that clients have a 5% genuine savings deposit. And then they also want you to be able to cover the upfront costs. And we'll talk about upfront costs in a second, but just quickly on genuine savings, because again, you'll hear about this quite a bit when you speak to your mortgage broker or your bank. Uh, genuine savings just identifies any savings that you've personally held in your account for at least three months. The idea behind it is that the bank wants to see that you've got the capacity to hold on to money and not spend it. That shows that you've got discipline. If you went to Crown Casino um, uh, last night and you uh, came home with $50,000, the bank would say, congratulations, well done on that winnings, but we'll hold on to it for three months and then we'll classify it as genuine savings because they want to see that discipline that you can hold on to money and not spend it. 
So it's really important when we're speaking to first home buyers that we confirm that the savings is actually in their account, not in their mom's account or in dad's account or in a friend's account, or, hey, I've lent someone $10,000 and they're going to pay me back tomorrow. That's great, but that $10,000 has to sit in your account for three months. So it's really important that it's in your account three months. Now, 5% of the purchase price. For those that are uh, not experts at math, um, I will do some mathing for you. Uh, if your purchase price is $300,000, a 5% deposit is $15,000. And you go down the scale, you can see if a purchase price is $700,000, you're looking at $35,000 um, as a minimum required deposit for that purchase. Now, the cost to purchase, um, we're focusing right now on purchases up to $600,000 because we know a purchase up to $600,000, as Dio mentioned earlier, you don't have to pay stamp duty. Stamp duty is normally uh, roughly 55 to 6% of the purchase price. So uh, a purchase of $600,000, if you weren't a first home buyer and you didn't qualify for the discounts, you'd have to put in about $36,000 just to cover stamp duty, plus your 5% deposit of $30,000. So when you're a first home buyer and you qualify for a full waiver of stamp duty up to 600, you see that stamp duty is zero. Settlement fee for the bank is roughly 300. Conveyancer, uh, who handles the legal transfer of ownership for this property, um, is about $1,500. Uh, transfer fees from the Victorian government are about 194. And registration is, uh, fees as well, also a Victorian government charge, they're about 1,500. So in total, your upfront cost for this $600,000 purchase is $3,500. So if we do some more mathing, we've got 5% of the purchase price and 5% or sorry, 5% uh, of the purchase price plus the upfront costs on a $600,000 purchase, 5% is 30,000. The upfront cost is 3,500. And we have a total required contribution from the client of $33,500. Now, here is a lovely chart that I've put together this evening uh, that shows you the deposit needed or the contribution needed at the end for each range of purchase. So for $300,000, you'd need a total of $18,500. $600,000, you'd need that $33,500 that I just mentioned. And then you see a massive jump up at $700,000. You now need $63,000 in uh, savings. And that's because your upfront costs have increased because now you have to pay stamp duty. You've gone over that $600,000 threshold. The government's now still giving you a discount on stamp duty, but you've got to pay a portion of it now. And so that's why your upfront costs have dramatically increased. Now, uh, every client's going to have uh, different amounts of savings, different amounts of income. Uh, and so we'll um, oftentimes be working with the client to try and find that sweet spot in how much they want to purchase for and how much savings they need to have in place. So um, these discussions are always best off one-on-one -on -one where we've got the client's sp um, specific situation in mind, um, but this should hopefully give you a rough idea. Uh, the next really big thing that we need to be concerned about is borrowing capacity. So with borrowing capacity, we're looking at your income, your debts, and your living expenses. If we focus on income first, what we're looking for are the different types of income. Uh, we've got PAYG income. So if you're full-time employed or part-time employed, um, uh, your uh, annual salary, uh, you could be potentially earning overtime commissions or bonuses. Uh, we treat those separate because banks will look at them differently. Uh, with your PAYG income, they will use 100% of it. With your overtime, um, depending on the type of industry that you're in, they will use between 80 and 100%. Uh, with commissions and bonuses, oftentimes we're needing to provide two full years of consistency before banks will allow us to use commissions and bonuses. If you stand back and put yourself in the bank's position, if they're going to give someone $600,000, they want to make sure that that income is consistent. It's not just one time that you've had a good sale um, or, you know, you've got this big bonus because your boss was nice to you, but, you know, for, um, you know, for the last five years, you've never received a bonus at all. Um, they want to see consistency to give them a bit more comfort. Um, Self-employed income, we can use the profits in the company. Uh, we can use add backs like depreciation and interest that you might be spending or, or might be claiming back. Uh, so we can use Centrelink income as long as the children are under the age of 12. Uh, and we can also use maintenance payments. Again, if the children are under the age of 12, um, then we shouldn't have any issues using that. 
Uh, when we look at debts, we're looking at credit cards. Um, uh, in the last couple of years, buy now, pay later accounts have really come on the scene strongly. Uh, so zip money, after pay, flexi pay, um, all those buy now arrange, or sorry, uh, buy now, pay later arrangements. Um, we ultimately have to account for a roughly $3,000 credit limit for each of those accounts. So oftentimes clients are having to close those accounts out before they apply for a loan because they affect your borrowing capacity. They bring your capacity down. Uh, personal loans and car loans are, are big um, concerns for us because obviously they come with higher monthly repayments. And the higher monthly cost you have going out, the less affordability you have for your mortgage. Um, HEX and HELP, uh, these used to be quite innocent, quite small debts that we didn't have to worry about back in the day. Um, but now that there is a required repayment based on the income that you earn, HEX and HELP are um, uh, oftentimes uh, impacting someone's borrowing capacity to a point where, you know, it might reduce your capacity by fifty dollars or $100,000. So um, there, there's sometimes, depending on the HELP balance or the HEX balance, um, there's not much that we can do, but if you're close to paying them off, oftentimes it's better that we get it paid off first uh, and then try to recoup the savings over time. Uh, and again, this is all, a, um, you know, unique and case by case. So we'll have a chat with you about your uh, unique position and work out what we need to do. Uh, also, maintenance payments. Um, if, um, if you are making uh, maintenance payments or child support payments, then we need to take that into account um, against your or treat it as a liability, basically. Uh, living expenses. Um, the banks are really, really keen on identifying people's living expenses and, and specifically those discretionary expenses. Um, now, some of these um, banks don't worry too much about, but other banks will treat them differently and, um, uh, and worry about them. So childcare costs, private health insurance, private school fees, uh, ongoing medical treatment like uh, orthodontics in Cairo. Uh, I've got two kids that are getting orthodontics right now, and my God, it's expensive. Um, so if you've got those ongoing costs, then we need to account for them in your application. Uh, gym memberships also, uh, oftentimes clients are paying $100 to $150 a month uh, for the gym membership, and that will impact borrowing capacity. So if we can try and eliminate some of these discretionary expenses, um, then that will help in your qualifying. Now, with borrowing capacity, let's go through a quick case study. If we've got someone that's on roughly $80,000, and this is a, a single um, a uh, single purchaser, uh, so they've got $80,000 income, they've got HEX and a credit card and the living expenses, they've got uh, private health insurance, they've got a gym membership. For this client, the maximum borrowing capacity right now is $375,000. Now that HEX, um, let's assume that that's a small balance. So if we look at this again and we say, well, let's try and get rid of the HEX and let's close off that credit card. Because with the credit card, even though you don't have a balance, it's the limit that the bank looks at. You might have a credit card for a $5,000 credit limit, but a zero balance. The bank will say, tomorrow you can go out and spend $5,000. So we're going to account for the worst case that you've got a $5,000 balance. So ideally, we're getting rid of credit cards. We're getting rid of HEX. We're going to leave the private health because oftentimes that's really important to have. Um, but we can try and get rid of that gym membership because maybe we can do without it. Well, now your bond capacity has increased by 75,000 just by getting rid of a couple of things. So during our discussion with clients, we're working out how we can try and maximize bond capacity by making small tweaks here and there to improve their position. Uh, your credit report um, is uh, becoming more and more important every day. Um, being from America, I am used to your life being driven by your credit score. And it wasn't the case when I first uh, moved to Australia in 2005 and I became a broker and uh, I was shocked. I was like, oh, uh, banks aren't even uh, asking for a credit score. They don't even care what your report looks like. Nowadays, they do. Um, your credit score is super, super important in determining if you're going to get approved or accepted by a bank. Um, new reports now show the conduct across all of your bank accounts to include your savings accounts, your credit card car loans, personal loans, every financial account that you have, the banks can now see it in your credit report. And what they're looking for is your conduct, your account conduct. Um, they're looking to see if we've got accounts that are in arrears, uh, late payments, credit cards that are over the limits, uh, court judgments and bankruptcies, because all of those things are smoke. And where there's smoke, there is often fire. And the banks are trying to prevent fire. 
they don't want to get involved with a client where there might be potential issues. Um, because what their risk assessment tells them is that if someone's got um, poor history on their credit card, they're more likely to default on their mortgage. So if we've got issues with credit score or your credit report, then we need to either wait until that comes off naturally. And oftentimes these things can stay on your report for five years, um, or we've got to start doing some work to try and get those things removed. And it's not an easy process. Some things we can try and, and help get removed. Um, there are some things that will stay on there until they run their natural course. So it just depends on how severe the issues are. Now, pre-approval. Um, as Dale mentioned earlier, pre-approval is uh, crucial right now because we're in uh, an environment where interest rates are increasing uh, on a monthly basis. And every time interest rates increase, your borrowing capacity decreases. So if you can imagine submitting an application to a bank today where they say your maximum loan is 400,000, and then tomorrow interest rates increase by a quarter point, your borrowing capacity is then dropped to 375. And then the next month it increases again, uh, the rates increase again, and your borrowing capacity drops further. And that borrowing capacity, or that, sorry, that pre-approval that you had is just dwindling and dwindling down uh, the longer we go. So, Lenders have a chance to assess your application in full when you get a pre-approval. They get to confirm your borrowing capacity and your savings and your credit score. It's super, super important that we give them that opportunity to do a full review on you and make sure that you're good to go for your borrowing. And then we can pick some lenders that will give you up to three months where they lock in your pre-approval regardless of whether rates go up or down. Um, and of the 40 banks on our panel, there are only about 10 or 15 that actually allow that three-month grace period while you're pre-approved. So as a broker, we're looking at not just interest rates and fees and, and uh, features that a, a bank product might have, but we're trying to take into account um, if a bank's going to give you three months grace on your pre-approval to make sure that it lasts and it gives you time to find a home, uh, even if interest rates might last. Now, choosing the right lender, I might hand back over to DL to um, work through how a mortgage broker works and how we help you uh, find the right lender. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, as I said at the, the start, pre-approvals for me are the most important part with buying your first home, especially with these rate rises. Uh, cannot stress how important they are enough. So highly, highly recommend uh, choosing the right lender. Now, as a broker, there are several different factors of... Uh, of your application that we need to consider before we know which lender is going to suit you best. And the biggest one, as you could imagine, uh, borrowing capacity and interest rates. How much can you afford with different lenders and what are they gonna charge you to borrow that type of money? Borrowing capacity does differ between lenders. A big part of that is like uh, David said, some treat overtime differently to others, some treat payday loans or, uh, um, uh, I'm struggling to find the word now, but um, buy now, pay later loans as well. And credit cards, they're all treated a little bit differently with other lenders. So some will give you more money than others. And obviously interest rates. What is this loan going to cost you and where is it going to be the cheapest time you with your capacity? The features that come alongside with a loan, uh, there are several more than what, uh, what this states, obviously the et cetera covers that. But offset and redraw are often the two biggest ones that we speak to clients about. The offset account is, uh, is something that a lot of clients want, but don't necessarily need. And redraw is a big one that comes with every loan, but uh, they do all want that very variable loan, I should say. Last one that we touch on is credit policy. Alongside borrowing capacity, every bank has a little bit of a different policy for their credit. Some banks will take 3% genuine savings rather than five. Some will look at uh, tenancy history if you're renting right now as genuine savings. So you could win at, uh, at uh, the Crown Casino, $50,000. And as long as you've been paying rent to the level of that genuine savings, the bank's okay. So everyone's a little bit different. And that's really, really important when we're trying to find the bank that suits you best and meets your goal with purchasing the first home for the price in the area that we're looking at. Now, there are a lot of lenders out there. We have about 40 on the panel at the moment, on Mortgage Choices panel right now. It's a lot of different policies. That's a lot of different rates. It's a lot of different borrowing capacities. 
And this is why a mortgage broker is so important because we have a look at all of them at the same time. So you don't need to go around to each bank saying, this is my income, this is my cash deposit, what can I afford? They say X, you go to the next one. This is my cash deposit, this is my income, what can I afford? Every time you do that, you receive a hit on your credit report. It comes back to what David mentioned, don't want a bad credit report. If you have multiple hits or multiple inquiries, your score goes down. Benefit of a broker is we can see all of the policies, all of the interest rates, all of the features with all of the lenders on our panel at the same time without putting a hit on your credit report. So we look at the 40, we figure out out of those 40, maybe four or five are going to suit you best in terms of a low interest rate and they have decent offers for first home buyers. They offer the grants that we need to use when we're purchasing. And out of those four or five, we think that there are two or three that might be great, but one that's really going to suit you best. And that's where we apply. We don't apply to every single one of those lenders on our panel. We find the one that is going to be best and that's where we go. So there is one hit on your credit report. There is certainty that this loan is best for you and it's going to work for you and what you're trying to achieve with this purchase. So I'm biased, but mortgage brokers are pretty important. And that really comes back to our next steps. Everything that we've spoken about tonight is, uh, it changes. So your borrowing capacity will be different to the next person's. Your deposit will be different to the next person's. And that's why you really need to speak with a mortgage broker and work out what is best for you, what is going to suit your situation best. And if you're not quite there, what goals and what steps can we put in place to reach that purchase? Once you've met with the mortgage broker and you've created that plan in terms of how much deposit do I need? How many debts do I need to close to make this work? That's when we move forward and we actually go ahead with the plan. And we've got clients that have been working towards their first house for 12 months, some that have come to us with no idea where they stand and they're ready to go and they purchase within a few weeks. Changes all the time, but the most important thing is that you talk to someone, you talk to your mortgage broker and you find out what's actually possible for you and if it's going to suit what you want to. I'm glad that you mentioned that uh, creating a plan is so important. A lot of clients that we speak to aren't ready to purchase um, and they need that 12 to 24 months to build up their income or build up their savings or to pay off debt. So um, I, I love speaking to clients regardless of what stage they're at. Um, and if it uh, allows us to then outline, you know, here are the goals that you need to achieve. Um, when you've got a plan, it makes it a lot easier. You've got some direction. Exactly. And, you know, as a, as a broker, some of the most rewarding deals are with those clients that have come to me and said, you know what, this is what I want to do. They're not ready. And then they spend the next six to 12 months really knuckling down and increasing their savings and paying down some debt to make sure that they can get into their home. And it just feels so good to see them finally get the keys and really appreciate the hard work that they've put in to get there. So speak to the broker first know what's going to work and what you need to do to get to that goal and take steps. So I really hope that this, uh, this webinar has helped and it's provided a, a lot of information. Uh, I want to run through a couple of questions. We've had some come through throughout the meeting. I haven't quite answered them just yet. Uh, so we're going to go through those. And uh, David, I might field this first one to you. Uh, if I use a guarantor, Am I limited to only their bank or can I still go with a lender that you recommend? Um, yes, you need to use uh, the guarantor's bank. If the guarantor has a home loan in place, then we need to use that same bank uh, for your loan. Um, there is something called a, a second mortgage that you can apply for. They're only with particular banks uh, um, and they're... Uh, one of the most difficult things that you can try and do. And when we're looking at someone trying to purchase a property where there's a very short time frame that we're trying to meet, um, and, and if you don't meet it, there are big consequences, uh, a second mortgage is not something that I would recommend. Um, and, and it's not even um, that viable. So I would say that uh, primarily you need to focus on using the lender that your parents are with. Yeah. And, and on the back of that, using your parents as a guarantor is exactly the same thing as using the government as a guarantor, provided you're purchasing within that, that range and you're eligible for the, the grant, of course, but 
the government taking the risk rather than your parents. And yes, there are a few banks that don't offer the scheme, but why not put the government in that position rather than your parents if, if you can? So uh, on top of that, a lot of people want to use their, uh, their parents or a guarantor to increase their borrowing capacity. Uh, so David, can you explain a little bit more about how that actually works? This is a very, very common question. So there are two types of guarantees. There's a security guarantee where we're just using the equity in mom and dad's home to help us reduce the amount of savings that we have to put in uh, and also to help us avoid some lenders mortgage insurance. And then there's another guarantee called a servicing guarantee. And servicing guarantees are where mom and dad come in and use their income to help you afford your loan because you don't have enough income to afford it on your own. And I think it was in about 2015 or 2016 when the federal government did their first review into lending where that got squashed. So no longer are banks allowed to offer servicing guarantees because of the government's concerns that um, parents were getting themselves in over their heads because they were trying to help their kids uh, live um, a lavish lifestyle that they couldn't afford. Uh, and I think it was a great decision by the government because even though it is somewhat beneficial for some clients, um, it sets the wrong precedent. And um, uh, I'd much rather see a first home buyer buy on their own, um, on their own hard work and off their own bat, um, than get mom and dad involved with trying to afford the loan. It's just not right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So if they can provide a little bit of equity to utilize, fantastic, but we don't want them to be liable for their payments at all. So, yeah, big change there. Uh, can my deposit come from a gift? Uh, so yes, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, the deposit that you have towards the purchase can come from a gift. Uh, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. Banks want to see savings. They want to see genuine savings that you've held for three months. So if your deposit is coming from a gift, you need to show money held for three months. On the back of that, genuine savings requirements and policies change between lenders. So some banks want to see that you have 5% uh, savings if you're borrowing more than 90% of the property's value. Some want to see it if you borrow more than 88% of the property's value. And so different lenders can offer different um, benefits in that sense. So yes, the deposit can come from a gift, but for the most part, if it's a smaller gift, um, uh, you know, comparably speaking, needs to be savings, genuine savings. Uh, but in, uh, this is a big one, David. Uh, can I purchase at auction? Uh, you can purchase at auction, but we don't recommend that first home buyers purchase at auction, especially if you're trying to put in the minimum required savings. Um, purchasing at auction, you are buying the property unconditionally. You're buying the property on the spot and you're required to pay a 10% deposit. And then you are hoping that your bank will then approve you so that at settlement, the bank's going to cover you with the loan. That doesn't, um, uh, sorry, um, just because you've paid your deposit doesn't mean the bank's actually going to approve the loan. So you could um, be successful at auction, pay your deposit, and then go to get finance and the bank says no. And then you're at risk of then losing your deposit and potentially getting sued for legal fees. So um, it's not something that we recommend for first home buyers because normally first home buyers are trying to borrow at the absolute top end that they can afford uh, and trying to put in the minimum deposit required. So there's just too much risk involved for a client if they're making that unconditional offer. We want clients to make offers that are subject to finance so that we then have time to go to the bank, get them fully approved by the bank and get the valuation done before they then pay their deposit and commit themselves unconditionally to that contract. Yeah, yeah. correct, absolutely. Uh, uh, this is another good one. Uh, do I need a credit card to build my credit score? Really, really common question, uh, David. Uh, yeah, so in America, you certainly did need to have a credit card to improve your credit score. And it was a crazy, stupid, backward scheme. Um, thankfully in Australia, you're not required to have any kind of liability or debt uh, to prove credit worthiness. Uh, as soon as you um, get a, a mobile phone plan, uh, that creates your credit report. If you've got a utility bill that you're paying for, a gas, electricity bill, a water bill, that will help create a credit report. Um, so you don't have to go out and get a credit card um, just to create your credit report. No. Or just to create a credit score. Yeah, and we see it so often, but uh, yeah, it's absolutely right. 
Uh, this is a bit of a general question. I'll take this one. Uh, is there a rule of thumb to know what my repayments are going to be? Uh, yes, uh, for every $100,000 that you borrow at a rate of 5%, which is around about where you pay right now, there are payments of $540 per month. So for argument's sake, if you purchased for uh, $500,000, or if you needed a loan for $500,000, we're looking at repayments of about $2,700 per month. And it's actually a really good question because a lot of clients try to tie their repayments in with their rent, if they're renting, not always possible. So with that in mind, $540 for every 100,000 that you borrow, does that fit within your budget? <clears throat> when creating a plan to purchase, what happens when you move in? Can you actually afford those repayments with your lifestyle? Really, really good question. Uh, got one here actually from the other side of the guarantors. Uh, if we go guarantor for our kids and they miss payments, what are the consequences and can it affect our credit rating? David. Yes, uh, it definitely can affect your credit rating because you're ultimately tied to their mortgage. Um, so when we do a guarantor loan, uh, we do two separate loans. We do an, a loan that is 80% of the purchase against the purchase property or the kid's property. And then we do the remaining required loan. Normally it's about 20% that's secured against mom and dad's property. Uh, and so mom and dad are um, basically guaranteeing that smaller loan. And if the repayments are not being made on that loan, then it could uh, definitely impact uh, credit score for the parents. And, and this um, gets us to the, the really important discussion that we need to have with guarantors to make sure that they understand the risks associated with being a guarantor. It, it's such a rewarding thing. I've got three kids and um, uh, I hopefully don't have to be a guarantor for them, but uh, I would certainly happily do that if they required it. And it's a great thing that parents can do to help out their kids and help them get a leg up. Um, uh, but you need to be aware of the risks. You need to be aware of how long it's likely that you'll need to be a guarantor uh, before they remove you. Uh, and you'll need to be aware of, you know, what if the stuff hits the fan? What do we do and how do we fix it? And how do we uh, make the best of a bad situation? So uh, as a mortgage broker, uh, we have a, an in-depth conversation with the applicants and just as in-depth of a conversation with the guarantors so that everyone's on board and understands what the risks are. Yeah. Correct. And we definitely try, uh, the guarantee is set over 30 years, similar to the, the mortgage that the clients take out. Ideally, we want that guarantor, that guarantee, sorry, removed within two to three years. And subject to big factors such as what happens with the market, does the property price go up or go down, uh, and how much debt have the clients reduced in that time. But we've had quite a few clients actually, um, thankfully, hit that goal. They've been able to remove their parents as guarantors within two to three years. And they then have 20% equity in the property, standing on their own two feet, works really, really well. But it's not something we can rely upon. And as David said, we have to outline that with the guarantors. We could have it for 30 years. And if the clients don't make payments, it could come back to bite you. So yeah, it's just all about informing and uh, discussing those risks. Now, uh, this, uh, I believe we went through this a little bit in the presentation, but should I wait a bit longer for property prices to drop before I start looking to buy? Uh, I'll, I'll take this one if you don't mind. Um, so the issue with waiting longer is that you're potentially waiting for rates to increase further. And every time interest rates rise, your borrowing capacity drops down. So you could well benefit by waiting six months um, and um, we could have a softer property market and you could save yourself five or 10% on the purchase price. Um, and you could also find that in five or six months, your borrowing capacity has de decreased so much that you can't afford that property anymore, regardless of whether it's decreased by five or 10%. So it's a little bit of a slippery slope and it's kind of back to what we were saying earlier, where it's really hard without hindsight to predict when you should purchase. Really yeah. hard. I'm glad you mentioned trying to offset the rate rises because that's something that I've seen a few clients struggle with. They need a little bit more savings to reach their goal, but then the rate rise knocks them out of the park. Yeah. And so for argument's sake, every rate rise that was coming through, they were losing forty to fifty thousand dollars worth of borrowing capacity. You can't keep up that level of savings every single month back to back. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. So 
when it's right for you. Yeah, best advice. A uh, bit of a two-parter actually, this is a big one. Uh, are there any differences between building or buying an existing property and what costs are associated with owning a property? Uh, differences with building and buying a property, obvious one is that you have to wait for the build to take place versus the existing property. Uh, in terms of grants, the difference comes back to that first homeowner grant that's only available if the property is brand new or built. So you don't get that when buying an existing property. The other big difference is stamp duty. Uh, stamp duty is payable on the value of the property when you buy it. Now, if you're buying an existing property, it's worth a lot more than if you're buying a block of land. So for argument's sake, you can purchase an existing property for $600,000, no stamp duty. You can buy a block of land for $600,000, no stamp duty, and then build on top of that. So that's the difference. You can increase the purchase price when you're building and still be eligible for those first home uh, owner grants and concessions, but you have to wait a lot longer. In waiting a lot longer, you have interest charges on the land loan while you're waiting for your build, uh, interest on the build as it takes place, potentially rent while you're waiting for the build to finish. And you also have the little bits and pieces that you don't get with an existing property. Um, curtains don't come when you build. Generally a driveway doesn't. A lot of builders are tying that in now, but generally not, and landscaping. So you could be saving yourself 50 to $60,000 by building, but then you lose all of that between interest charges and upgrades to the house that you're building and landscaping and things like that. So pros and cons. And as I said, building is quite risky in terms of the time that we have to wait, what that does to your borrowing capacity and, and what happens in the property market if the value goes up or down by the time you're ready to, to pay for it and the bank's ready to pay for it. On the back end of that, what's associated with owning a property? What kind of costs? Uh, big ones, uh, council rates is, uh, is the big one. Roughly, correct me if, if you think I should adjust this, David, but roughly $1,800 to $2,000 a year for council rates in you know, uh, Casey and Cardinia around that area. So about $2,000 a year. Utilities, obviously. Um, one thing that uh, also shocks clients a little bit is connection fees. So when they're renting, they'll pay uh, utility charges, the usage charges, but they don't have the connection charge. That is included when you own the property. And roughly $100 for each utility, 100 bucks for gas, 100 for electricity, 100 for water every month on average. Solar panels, water tanks, that all changes things, but roughly 100 each. Uh, so they're probably the biggest things to keep in mind. Um, one thing that I also know has hit a lot of clients is the constant need for maintenance or knickknacks. Uh, when you buy your first home, you likely don't have enough furniture to fill the whole house. You likely don't have everything where you want it to be or the color scheme that you want it to be or the carpet that you want. Houses need maintenance and they need upgrading and updating all the time. And that sets a lot of clients back when they move in. And it comes back to what David mentioned, have a good savings buffer when you purchase a house to do things like that or to cover increased mortgage costs because there's always little extras that pop up. Uh, you might need a new hot water service within six months of moving into the house. Uh, those kind of things can be quite expensive. So hopefully that answers the question. Uh, looks like just one last one for you, David. Uh, how long after I pay off a debt can I apply for a mortgage? Yeah, good question. Um, so uh, with... Uh, existing debt, oftentimes we are submitting pre-approval applications with that debt still open. And we're just mentioning to the bank in the application that um, the client wants to purchase for $600,000. Once they do purchase, they will then close off their credit card. And what that allows us to do is leave that debt open and not close it off until we know that we need a loan or that we're going to get a loan. Um, so uh, in case the bank knocks us back, you're not wasting your savings paying down a credit card or closing off a credit card unless we know that it actually needs to be closed because we're really close to getting a formal approval. So that's part of the discussion that we'll have uh, in that first meeting to work out, is it a debt that you need to start working on now? Or is it something that can be left open and then closed just before you've purchased? Yeah, that's one of my favorite things about pre-approvals. It's 
it's kind of like an I promise bank. If I do this, can I have the money? I promise I'll close my credit card. I promise I will pay off my car loan. And they say yes. And then you've got a bit more time to do that. So yeah, yeah good question. Well, that's just about everything that we uh, had tonight. I haven't seen any more questions come through. So I might, uh, I might leave it there. Uh, as I said at the start, hopefully this has um, provided a lot of information for you and highlighted that there is quite a lot to consider when purchasing your first home, but there is help out there, starting with your mortgage broker. So uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you, David, for all the insight and uh, running through the webinar tonight. And, uh, I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Lovely. Thanks, guys.